Turn to the book of Exodus chapter number 8 and verse number 25. We know how the Lord spared Israel. We know how that Joseph had been raised up in Egypt. And Joseph was second only to Pharaoh. And because of his position, he was able to feed his people. And he fed them. And they came to the land and the famine. And Jacob came. And he came with his family. And there they stayed. And they were blessed. And they multiplied. And they grew. Then the Bible says there rose up a Pharaoh that knew not Joseph. And knew not Jacob. And knew not Israel as he had. And he began to persecute them bring them into bondage. Now, one of the biggest controversies in the Bible is who the Pharaoh of the Exodus was. We don't know who he was, but some folk take this position, some another. I don't spend a whole lot of time in stuff like that because it's really not that important to me. But we do know that an Egyptian Pharaoh persecuted the children of Israel. He put them in bondage. He was a pagan from head to toe. He had many gods, many, many, many gods. And these gods he worshiped. But I wonder sometimes if he didn't think that he could control some of his gods. And he himself had authority and power over them. But he's about to come in contact with a god that he can't see. One that he can't control. One that obviously does not know. It's the god of the slaves. And he says, I'm sure with contempt, you're a slave. You're a slave in my country. And you want me to fear your god? And that, of course, is the attitude that he took. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 8, and verse 25, the scripture says, And Pharaoh called for Moses and for Aaron and said, Go ye, sacrifice to your God in the land. The Lord had been bringing some problems down upon the Egyptians. We, get, we can read about that and study about all of the gods of the Egyptians. He said, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to judge your gods. And, of course, he did. But in the process of this, Pharaoh was a compromiser. And he was willing to give a little bit, but not a lot. And we see four different ways that he tried to compromise with the children of Israel while they were there in bondage. The first way was this. Pharaoh called Moses, said, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. In other words, you stay here and you can sacrifice to him. Well, we understand that that's a problem. And the problem is this. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. I live here. I have to work here. And we, we are Americans here. But there is a line of that you don't cross. There is a place in this country, in its culture and in its time, that's not ours. It's not, we're not part of it. And we have to find that. Every one of us has to find it for ourselves, what that separation is and what it means to us in our own personal life. But of course, Pharaoh, he wanted to make a, uh, he wanted to compromise with them. Well, Pharaoh's a type of the devil. And that's exactly what the devil will do. If he can't stop you from serving God and seeking the face of the Lord, he will begin to compromise and offer you compromises. And one of them is, well, all right, you're okay, okay. If I can't stop you, at least, but you're going to have to stay in this world. And so why not enjoy the things of God and enjoy the things of the world at the same time? Why not straddle the fence and you can get the best of both worlds? And aren't they writing books like that now? Aren't they in some of the mega churches in this country? Your best life now, you know, now, here, in this world. But the Apostle Paul said, this world is not my home. Amen. And then we have another compromise in chapter number 8 of the book of Exodus in verse number 28. Here's compromise number 2. And Pharaoh said, I will let you go to offer your sacrifices to the Lord your God in the desert, but not too far away. In other words, they're going to be borderline Christians. That's what you'd call that. And who's a borderline Christian? Well, we know that Lot was certainly a borderline believer. He was a believer. Peter said that the, the, the filthy conversation of the wicked vexed his righteous soul. That's what Peter said. So I accept what the apostle says about Lot. He sure didn't have much of a testimony, set in the gate of Sodom. But the bottom line is, he wasn't that far away from Abraham. You see, he was in the outskirts and he paid dearly for it. He wound up committing incest with his daughters and it happened when he was in a drunken state. But I'll tell you right now, I believe he spent the rest of his life regretting and sorrow having incest with his daughters. Moab and Ammon came from it. That's a horrible, I'd rather be dead than to have that happen to me. But it happened to him and he had to live with it. Incest with his own daughters. That's a sad thing. Here's a compromise number three, Exodus chapter 10, verse eight. And Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, but who are they that shall go? See how he's working? If you can't stop him, he's going to work it out. And he says, who's going to go? In verse number 11, not so, Pharaoh says. Go now ye that are men and serve the Lord, for that ye did it desire, and they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Now wait a minute, we're missing something. If only the men can go. What's missing? The women and the children. And what kind of worship service do you suppose that they could have had with their wives and their children? 
left back in Egypt, amen? I mean, what are you living for? What are you working for? Which is more important to you, your family or your job? Which is more important to you, your family or your car? Which is more important to you, your family or, 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 uh, or any possession in this world? The family is the most precious thing you have. Your children is the heritage of the Lord. He lends them to you. They're yours for a little while. And then it's up to you to ask God for wisdom to know how to raise those children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Serving. Raise up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he'll not depart from it, he says. No, you can't give them your kids. And here's the sad thing. Caesar wants your children. I'm surprised that he's allowing homeschooling. I don't know if you know this or not, but the homeschool roles have swelled. I mean, people, what I say by that is they're not going back to the public school system. And it has some benefits. Benefit number one, you don't have to worry about getting shot to death. Benefit number two, you don't have to worry about being hit upon by a sodomite. Benefit number three, you're, you, 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 you can be sometimes in a very good learning environment. There's a lot of benefits to it. You do lose the social interaction when you have ball games and so forth and all of that. But the thing is, we live in a strange world. We live in a strange culture. Things have really changed. And then finally, the fourth, the, the, uh, the fourth compromise is in Exodus 10, verse 24. And Pharaoh called Moses and said, Go you serve the Lord, only let your flocks and your herds be stayed. Let your little ones also go with you. And Moses said, Thou must give us also our sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice unto the Lord our God. Why did he want to keep their flocks? Because they could have no blood sacrifice if they didn't have their flocks. And that's the only thing you can sacrifice to God is a blood sacrifice and they knew it and they learned it the hard way i'm sure they were well versed in the gods of the egyptians and i know that in a moment of weakness they failed the children of israel did and they went back to apis the bull and aaron said these be your gods O israel this was done while moses and aaron were at the top of the mountain so they had a relapse in their faith but god brought them through it and it took them for for 40 years and he purged them in the wilderness and he refined them as gold is refined and for 40 years, the children of Israel walked. And the old generation passed away and a new one came on. And then God lovingly brought them into the land. They camped at Gilgal. And there the reproach was rolled away. Then they crossed the Jordan and went into the land. God never failed them. He never has and he never will. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 20 says, And when thy son asked thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. But let me tell you something. The Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And when he hardened his heart, Pharaoh did something that he probably would never have done. In Exodus chapter number 14, and verse 22 through 28, the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked upon the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians, and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. So the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. The Lord said to Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled after it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned, covered the chariots, and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. Why would a man in his right mind go down in between the walls and an ocean like he wasn't in his right mind. His heart had been hardened. In his blazing anger and rage against the children of Israel, he allowed himself to pass beyond sanity into insanity. And I began to look at all these plagues that came upon Egypt, and I thought, you know what? The book of Revelation is full of plagues too. And we've got a Pharaoh in Revelation too. He's called the Antichrist. And he has his armies too. I get to look into it and I thought, well, let's look at that. In the book of Exodus, chapter number 9, verses 20 through 26, hail comes down upon the Egyptians. In Revelation chapter number 8, the first angel sounded and there followed hail, fire mingled with blood. In Revelation chapter number 16 and verse 2, under the vile judgments, and the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast 
and upon them which worshipped his image. God is beginning to judge the earth like he judged Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He's consistent in that. Don't you notice carefully though what happens. In the book of Exodus chapter number 7, the water, the Nile River is turned into blood. They worship the Nile and their God was defiled and defaced in their presence. Under Revelation chapter number 8, under the trumpet judgments, verse 8, the second angel sounded and as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. You can't imagine how this earth is going to change when something like that happens. You'd say, well, surely that would turn men to the Lord. No, the Bible says neither repented they. As I said to you this morning, I believe we're going into that. I believe we're going into that time. I've never seen anything like this before. Nothing, it seems, softens the hearts of the people today. They're hardened. Revelation 16, verse 3, under the vile judgments, the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. In uh, Exodus chapter number 7, the fresh water, the fresh water is polluted. In Revelation chapter number 8, a third angel sounded, the fell a great star from heaven, burned as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, upon the fountains of water. Imagine wanting a drink and you can't get one. Under the vile judgments in Revelation 16, 4, the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. He says in the book of Revelation, I'm going to give you blood to drink because you're worthy. That's to paraphrase it. He forbade them in the Old Testament to drink blood. The children of Israel were forbidden from day one. You never drink blood. In Exodus chapter number 10, darkness comes down upon the land. And the Lord said to Moses, Exodus 10, 21, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. And under the trumpet judgment, Revelation chapter number 8 and verse 12, the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Darkness. Revelation 16 verse 8, the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, Power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and the men were scorched with great heat, blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. God's a holy God. He cannot pass sin off without it being justified. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. The Lord Jesus paid the sin price so that we could be justified by the death of one who wasn't. Plagues come down in Exodus chapter number 10, locust, in the book of Revelation chapter 9 under the trumpet judgments locust revelation 16 under the vile judgments locust these come up on the face of the earth according to revelation chapter number nine the bottomless pit is opened an angel has the key to the bottomless pit and from it comes a polyon and a bat the same name for the one individual they both mean, mean destruction the destroyer and he comes up out of the bottomless pit he and his angels there's a whole spirit world out there right now waiting because they know something is coming they don't know when the Lord Jesus is going to come, but they know something is coming. They're far more attuned to the spiritual condition of this country than most people are. The spirit world is no fool. When the demon said to the Lord Jesus, we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Have you come to torment us before the time? The very fact the Lord Jesus was in their presence was torment. Have you noticed how that this, uh, for most of the culture today in America, they just absolutely can't stand to be around a Christian. Have you noticed that? You know why? Because they're full of demons. That's why. People are demonic. They're possessed by demons. Demonic possession. In the book of Exodus chapter 8, frogs come down upon the people. Frogs. In the book of Revelation, under the trumpet judgments, I heard the sixth angel sounded, and I heard the voice from the four horners of the golden altar saying, Before God, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates, and the four angels loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand. And I heard the number of them, which is two hundred million. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. 
By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads with them, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And in Revelation chapter 16, three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Pharaoh's heart was so hardened that even when faced with something supernatural beyond his wildest dreams, he drove right into it anyway. The counterpart to that will be the Antichrist. When he sees something that is so wild that it defies explanation, he's still going to drive right into it. Turn to Revelation 19, verse 11. I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. There's only one that fits that category, just one, the Lord Jesus Christ. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns, yet a name written that no man knew but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. The armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth out the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his vesture and on his thigh name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come, and gather yourselves together to the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Now watch verse number 19. Meditate on this. And I saw the beast. This is the New Testament Pharaoh. This is the Antichrist. Revelation 13, the beast. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. See that? They're going to battle and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. We no doubt in anybody's mind what's going on here. The Antichrist with his armies. We're talking about armies. He may have 10 million strong. He may have the highest technology earth has to offer. He may have everything beyond the wildest imagination. But when he sees heaven open, it opens and a white horse, and then him that sits on it, doesn't stop him. It would stop me, would it stop you? I'd step back and say, hold on a minute. It didn't stop him, why? His heart is hard. It's hard as steel. Like it says in the book of Job, when it's talking about Leviathan, it says he has a heart of steel, stone. And this is what causes the battle to be fought. Look at it. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the host and against his army. They're going to make war with the Son of God. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Isaiah chapter 14 says another thing about this. It adds a little something to it. It says that when the Lord Jesus comes back, he's going to take him and he's going to lay him out. The Antichrist looks like a man. Going to lay him out on the ground. And the people are going to say, is this the man that caused the world and nations to tremble? And they're going to watch their God. They're going to watch their Lord when the Lord Jesus takes him and he cast him into the lake of fire and brimstone. From that moment on, there is no doubt whatsoever who Almighty God is. No doubt. When you harden your heart, that means that you shut God out. And that's what people are doing now. They're hardening their heart. Do you know why? Conviction is uncomfortable. To see yourself the way you really are is very uncomfortable. There's three views of you. God sees, you see, and they see. What God sees, He looks through lens of grace down upon His creature. What you see, you are filtered most of all by your ego. What the world sees is something entirely different than what you normally think you are. They see you in an entirely different light. I would tonight that by the grace of God, we would not let our hearts harden, but we would let them be softened, that we can repent, that we can cry, that we can weep, that we can pray, that we can read our Bibles, that we can be right with God, that we can fellowship, that we can witness. And there's not much time left to witness because Heaven is going to open, and 
he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now in theology, what I just read to you is called the revelation. That's when the Lord Jesus Christ makes himself known to creation. He comes back as the creator and the almighty and the judge of the earth. He came the first time as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world, and he did. He came the first time as the shepherd. He comes the next time as the king of kings.